Lord, sometimes we're sitting here, we got a smile on our face, and inwardly we're just messed up in our head about something. Father, we know that we are so utterly imperfect, and we fight with all kinds of things. And sometimes, even during a sermon, we're fighting, we're wrestling inside. Father, we ask right now that you would just calm our hearts, calm our minds, help us to just submit our hearts and minds to you right now. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to rely on your Holy Spirit right now to teach us, to be our teacher, our instructor, because we know, Lord, that without you, we can't even understand the text because this exceeds any intellectual exercise, Lord, that we can engage in. This is a spiritual matter. And we need your spirit, Lord, to reveal your word to us. And I pray that you would speak to this flock. Speak to my heart, God. Open the eyes of our hearts as we sing. We wanna see you, Lord. We wanna see you in your word. We wanna behold you, Lord, as we look into your word today. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak. And we want to yield to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Chapter 4, let's begin reading. <clears throat> verse 1. We're going to read all the way down through verse 6. Therefore, <clears throat> since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has, for this purpose, been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. End quote. Let's go back to verse one. <clears throat> verse one. <clears throat> Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh Arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Let's stop right there at that first part. Now, notice in the beginning of the chapter, we have the word, therefore. So that means we have, there's a connection somewhere to something, right? The word, therefore, actually draws a conclusion from the previous verses, chapter 3, verses 18 through 22 which features Christ's victory over the hostile powers by virtue of his death and resurrection. We sang about that just moments ago. <clears throat> you know, we have overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Now, the connection between these two sections is this. Since Christ's suffering is the pathway to glory, Believers should also prepare themselves to suffer, knowing that suffering is the prelude, prelude to an eschatological reward. The main point of the verse is that believers are to arm themselves, as it says, with the intention, with the same purpose that Christ had, with the intention to suffer. Now, the phrase there, arm yourselves, has obvious 
military connotations. And it sets our sights on the discipline and the grit needed to live the Christian life, particularly in view of the suffering that believers encounter. Indeed, believers must arm themselves with the purpose or the intention that suffering is inevitable. Yes, it's inevitable. Thus, just as Jesus willingly embraced the suffering that a godly life so often provokes, we too must determine without complaint or bitterness to endure unjust treatment for identifying with him. That may include things like slander, enduring slander, enduring ridicule, enduring rejection, enduring social ostracism. Now we see this especially when we look at John chapter 15. I'll read it to you if you want to turn there. You can. I don't know if you'll make it by the time I'm done reading. But John 15, 18 says, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, and because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you that a slave is not greater than his master? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my word, they will also keep yours. That's a good thing, isn't it? But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they know not the one who sent me. Now that's important right there. They just don't know the one who sent me. Now, looking back at 1 Peter, the second part of verse 1, and on into verse 2, opens our understanding about being armed. What does it mean to be armed? Arm yourselves likewise, it says, with the same purpose. Then it says, because, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So that word because there indicates a reason. There is a motive for this. They should be willing, like Christ, to suffer for doing right, for whosoever has says has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, what does that mean? He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, as a general statement, without any qualification, this would not be true. For there are many people who have suffered physically and yet still sin very much. Nor is Peter simply saying that physical suffering somehow purifies and strengthens all people. It does strengthen some, but there are others that become even more rebellious toward God and embittered against God when they suffer. So we have to read this in the light of the theme of suffering for doing right, which we read about in the preceding verses. The kind of suffering in the flesh that Peter means is defined by what we read back in chapter 3, verse 17, which says, for it is better to suffer for doing right if that should be God's will than for doing wrong. Therefore, whoever has suffered in the flesh, it says, has ceased from sin. What that means is, whoever has suffered for doing right and has still gone on obeying God in spite of the suffering that it involved, that individual has made a clear break with sin. The phrase, has ceased from sin, obviously cannot mean no longer sins at all, because certainly it's not true that everyone who has been willing to suffer for doing right, <clears throat> not everyone 
is willing to do that, and several passages in Scripture rule out the idea that anyone, that anyone can be absolutely free from sin in this life on this side of glory. We know that it's true that we don't actually cease from all sin from the time we get saved till the time we die. We still do sin. But rather what this means is the individual has demonstrated that they've made a clear break with sin that they have most definitely acted in a way that shows that obeying God, not just avoiding hardship, is the most important motivation for that individual and in how they live their lives. Does that make sense? So in other words, they are demonstrating by the fact that they're willing to suffer, that they have in fact submitted themselves to the will of God and they're willing to do so to the degree that they're perhaps willing to die for it. It shows they've made that break because of how much they suffer. Thus, following through with a decision to obey God, even when it will mean physical suffering, has a morally strengthening effect on our lives. And it commits us more firmly than ever before to a pattern of action where obedience is more important than our desire to avoid pain. Does that make sense? It, where obedience is even more important to us than our desire to avoid pain. I want to read to you a couple of quotes. One writer said, Peter emphasized that those who commit themselves to suffer, those who willingly endure scorn and mockery for their faith, show that they've triumphed over sin. They have broken with sin because they have ceased to participate in the lawless activities of unbelievers and endured the criticisms that have come from such a decision. The commitment to suffer reveals a passion for a new way of life, a life that is not yet perfect, but remarkably different from the lives of the unbelievers in the Greco-Roman world. To make a break with sin is to resolve not to live the remainder of one's earthly life for human passions, but for God's will. When one suffers for what is right, it is an indication that one has renounced sinful human desires and embraced the will of God as a higher value, end quote. John MacArthur said this, you can usually get a pretty good quote out of John MacArthur. John MacArthur said, the apostle was not expressing a new concept to his readers. Jesus had taught positively that if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And negatively he said that he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Taking up one's cross has no mystical connotation and means more than merely some extra spiritual dedication. When Jesus spoke of taking up the cross, his listeners knew he was talking about being executed on the cross. They knew exactly what he meant. They must confess Jesus as Lord no matter what, even if it meant to die physically for his sake. The Apostle Paul understood well the principle of cross-bearing. Paul said, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh so that death works in us, he said, but life in you, end quote. It's easy, right? When you're, if you are a professing Christian and life gets tough and you just say, eh, enough of this God stuff. That's no testimony, what does that say about the testimony of that individual? But verse one leads us into verse two because verse two is the <clears throat> continuation of thought. 
He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, verse 2, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So in this verse, the apostle tells his readers why God breaks the power of the sinful nature at the moment that the Christian is saved. And this is the Christian goal in life, is it not? What it says right here, can there be a more succinct way of stating our mission of sanctification so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer <clears throat> for the lusts of men but for the will of God. Consider these cross references. Ephesians 4.17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their heart. The apostle wrote to the Ephesians, we know, let's, let's not walk that way. Remember how they walked, how you walked, and don't walk that way. Philippians 1.29, for to you it is given, it is, had been, has been granted, excuse me, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, speaking of Christ, that he died for all so that they who, might, who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God, verse three continues the flow of thought. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires, the desire of the Gentiles. Now we're gonna get to the vice list in just a moment. But I wanna read to you the beginning part of verse three in the New English Translation. For the time that has passed was sufficient for you to do what the non-Christians desire. Now, the time already passed is speaking of their life without Christ, pre-redemption. The passage here is a very vivid description of the tragic and devastating life pattern of the unconverted, which ends inevitably in judgment. These verses parallel several of Paul's descriptions of humanity's lost condition and describes the character and consequences of sin. Peter reminds believers here to leave <clears throat> all that behind because he says it belongs to their former life in sin and under judgment. The word sufficient there in this context means more than simply adequate. It actually conveys the sense of being more than enough. Peter's readers had had a whole life of opportunity to sin. And <clears throat> that it is more than enough to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles and to have lived a life to fulfill all the sinful passions. In other words, <clears throat> you've run with the pack long enough. It's time to set all of that behind. You have fulfilled all that needs to be fulfilled in doing all of that. The word desire here conveys the sense of being a purposed longing. The hearts of the unsaved are determined to follow their passions. And Peter called that way, <clears throat> in back in chapter one, verse 18, he called that their futile way of life. That former disposition pursued a course. It conducted life's affairs along a specific path of destructive behavior. In fact, if you want to turn there, you can real quick. <clears throat> uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. 
or I can just read it to you. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, notice the phrasing here, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Just a reminder, he's saying to them, of what you came out of. 1 Corinthians 6.11, after giving a vice list, the apostle Paul says, such were some of you. This is the way you used to be, but now you are washed, but now you are sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Colossians 3, 7, in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Titus 3, 3, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. End quote. You can turn on back to Peter now. <clears throat> one writer said, Peter is adamant that the time that has passed suffices for such behavior. The force of his language is simple. Enough already. Instead, Believers are to arm themselves with this thought. Any degree of past sinning is enough. No one could ever sin so little so as to say, I need some more time to sin. <clears throat> End quote. Or I've heard someone say, Lord, save me, but not yet. Now, before we move on to the vice list, we're going to go through that. I want to address the person who perhaps has never engaged in the sinful practices that we are about to expose and discuss. Because some don't have the kind of sinful pasts that others do. Some people are saved at a very young age and they do not carry a lot of baggage from their past that haunts or tempts them. So I have a few things to say about this. So if you're one of those people, listen. <clears throat> Number one, thank God if you were saved at a young age. You're not missing out on anything. Your testimony isn't less significant. In fact, it's even more powerful if you have spent the earliest years of your life dedicated to God. It's a testament to God's keeping power. There is nothing to envy about another fellow believer who lived a significant portion of their life serving Satan and the flesh while you didn't. If you were able to taste and see that the Lord is good in your youth, you want to make sure that you spend ample time bowing your heart in praise to God for sparing you from the ravishes of a sinfully indulgent past. There's nothing to envy about the past and you just need to continue to redeem your time. Number two, something else to those in this, in this category, something to take to heart. Do not be deceived by the world's deceptive luster. You do not need to sow some wild oats. There's nothing to be gained by taking a chance on being a prodigal. You may not come back. If you feel that serving God and focusing on righteous living in your youth has kept you from having fun, and you let that draw you into experimenting with sin, you will pay a price, and you might pay a price that you will never recover from. You need to know that. Galatians 6 says, 
Do not be mocked, or excuse me, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his fl own flesh will from, from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. We read in Genesis 34, 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. That was a bad choice to do. And how did the land taste? Bad. It bit her, and it bit her hard. There are dozens of proverbs of fathers warning their sons about the seductive dangers that are waiting to swallow them up. And this is why it says in Proverbs 4, 25, let your eyes look directly ahead. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil, end quote. That's Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. I remember when I was a newer believer, a younger man, <clears throat> uh, one of my roommates, good friend of mine at the time, <clears throat> appeared to have a love for the Lord. Uh, he was saved at a very young age and he was always tempted by the intrigue. He was intrigued by what he didn't get to experience. He knew my testimony, the life of sin that I lived, and something in his mind made him think, yeah, man, I wish I just could have tried it just to see what it's like. So he decided later, after I moved out, moved out here to Manassas, he decided that he was gonna test the waters. That was a long time ago, and as of just a few months ago, he still... <clears throat> was living in a life of abandonment to God. He thought he was snared, or he thought he would test, and he ended up being ensnared. Many decades ago, many decades ago, Keith Green wrote a song to his then infant son, Josiah. The name of the song is A Song for Josiah. Two of the lines of the song read this way. Well, if I could, I would protect you from what you will see. This world will promise love and beauty, but it lied to me. That's one of the lines. The other line is this. Well, if I could, I would protect you from what you will see. This world might seem so alive, but it's dead to me. Amen. There's nothing but death in the world. One last word to those who were saved at a young age. You may not have painted the town with blood, but trust me when I tell you that you were conceived in sin like everyone else. And you, even as that young person, you deserved God's wrath just as much as the serial killer. We would sometimes lose sight of the fact of just how sinful little children are how selfish they are, how covetous they are, how deceptive they are. Not my little angel. My little angel isn't like that. Yes, our little angels are sinners in need of salvation. Watch them. Watch how, self, watch how they fight. It's just that they're little and they can't express themselves like they can when they get older. But they're just as devious as anybody. So as a young person who may have become born again at a young age, you had a very large catalog of sins that needed to be forgiven by the time you made your childhood profession of faith. And if you don't believe that, ask your parents. <laughs> <clears throat> My kids were demons when they were little kids. No, they weren't actually demons, but they did behave that way often. So... <clears throat> enough about that. I just felt it was important to mention those things. Now let's go back to our text. 
for the time already, for the time already passed, is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course. Now, that word is important because the course described here refers to a list of sinful choices. No doubt, patterns of sin that were common to this community. Now, as I said earlier, there are several of these lists and the lists have some overlap but they help us to identify specific types of sins. And they also help us to see that there's nothing new under the sun. The same types of sins that we face today are the same types that mankind has faced since the fall. Number one is the word sensuality. That word is defined in a lexicon, Greek lexicon, as living without moral restraint debauchery, indecency, flagrant immorality. One writer said, it is a man who knows no restraint, a man who has sinned so much that he no longer cares what people say or think. It is something far more distasteful than just doing wrong. The man who mis misbehaves usually tries to hide his wrong, but a sensual man... <clears throat> A sensual man does not care who knows about his exploits or shame. He wants, therefore, excuse me, he wants, therefore, he seeks to take and gratify. Decency and opinion do not matter. Initially, when he began to sin, he did just as all men do. He misbehaved in secret, but eventually the sin got the best of him to the point that he no longer cared who saw or who knew. Next word on the list here is the word lusts, which is similar in meaning. It means undistrained desire for something, unrestrained desire for something. And it likewise is a comprehensive term and denotes the depraved cravings and inner vicious desires of fallen human nature that drive men to open excesses. We marched around for a whole month prideful in this country about our excesses. Isn't that amazing that we would wave that pride banner around as Pastor Reggie taught on Wednesday night, waving that flag because we're so proud of what we are this month? It's a shame. It's a shame. Next word is drunkenness. King James Version reads, excess of wine... Interestingly, it's a term that's used only here in the New Testament. And the word drunkenness as used here, this Greek word means overindulgence, insobriety, or wine-bibbing. Now, it would include taking a drink, getting drunk, getting intoxicated, or being intoxicated by drugs. Marijuana, do I dare bring that up now? right? <clears throat> Recreational marijuana. It means becoming tipsy or intoxicated, seeking to loosen moral restraint for bodily pleasure. Related to drunkenness is the word carousing. Carousing. According to one source, in the Greek writings, properly, definition here, a nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus, the wine god, or some other deity, and sing and play before the houses of their male and female friends. Hence, use generally of feasts and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry, end quote. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Similar to this, we have the phrase drinking parties, really is synonymous with carousing. Romans 13, 13 says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 5, 7 says, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. It's interesting that it's worded this way 
because in the years leading up to my conversion to Christ, the bar scene was my life. That was my life. And everything that I just said and read to you was really precisely the way that it was for me. Thank God that he pulled me out of that. The next phrase that's used there is abominable idolatries. This vice concludes the picture here by pointing to the root of the evil evils portrayed. Those idolatries involved the worship of many gods. They took various forms in which devotion to the idols was expressed. I mean, idolatry, the actual worshiping of false gods and idols was, a, was very much a part of the Greco-Roman world. And this idol worship encouraged, it's part of its exercise, sometimes both drunkenness and sexual vice and laxity. The adjective here, abominable, is found elsewhere in the New Testament only in Peter's own words in Acts 10, 28, where the word actually means unlawful. Now today, many of these practices have been divorced from physical idols, but they are still carried on in contempt of God. The argument that some activities were condemned primarily because they were associated with idolatry, with actual worshiping of physical idols, is scarcely a warrant for assuming that the activities in themselves are morally or spiritually neutral. They are not. <clears throat> While evil in themselves, they are all the more evil <clears throat> as lifestyles that ha want nothing whatsoever to do with God. First, Corinthians 10, 14 says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Colossians 3, 5 says, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And of course, we know that idolatry is not limited to bowing before statues and <clears throat> and drinking and committing lewd acts in front of statues, we know that idolatry could be the love of money or the love of, of stuff. All of that could be a form of idolatry. Some people party in different ways, right? Some people are enslaved to different types of idols. Now, verse four. <clears throat> Look at verse four. We're just about over. But I want to read one thing to you. Verse four. In all of this, they, the unsaved world, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you. Now, we're not going to take the time to expand on verse 4 the way that I want to and the way that I will, Lord willing, next week. But I thought it would be very fitting to end with this quote. And I quote, in light of verse four. It genuinely surprises unbelievers that Christians have no desire to join in <clears throat> and they abuse them for it or they literally blaspheme them. Though that word is, is more often used of profanity in regard to God, it can be used of the vilification of God's people. In many parts of the world today, you can profess the Christian faith without too much inconvenience, so as long as you are prepared to join them in their reckless pursuits. There is such a variety of beliefs that they have no problem in accommodating yours, that is until you opt out by saying, that's not for me, or I'm drawing the line at that. Notice then how the atmosphere changes. As a general principle, either we are going to please God or we shall please men. And if we please men, we will almost certainly make it our practice not to please God. And this is due partly to the fact that the world doesn't understand. And, and any of us are suspicious of something or someone who is different. But their antagonism is more likely because our lifestyle makes them uncomfortable. 
What a perverse and peculiar world we live in. If an individual, because of a dissolute life, causes harm to himself and disruption to his family, the world may not take too much notice. If, on the other hand, he stops drinking and lives a pure life, many think that he has gone mad. <laughs> but that puts him in very good company, end quote. I mean, I remember when I got saved and people thought, have you joined a cult? I was just out drinking and snorting Coke with you, and now you're asking me, because I don't want to do that anymore, if I joined a cult? I just got done worshiping Satan with you. And now you're asking me if I joined a cult? You're concerned for me? I mean, that is bizarre, isn't it? And they think it's strange that you will not indulge in the excesses that you once happily indulged in with them. And so they are surprised, it says. Now we're going to expound a little bit more on this, Lord willing, next week. So let's just go ahead and put a period right there. Yes, it is an odd thing that they would think that way. <clears throat> they think it's odd. <clears throat> and we are very odd as Christians because the world is on a course and they're committed to that course. They're committed to <clears throat> that worldview. They're committed to those sins. They're committed to that because they're serving the God of this world, who the Bible describes as Satan. And many of them don't even know it. Some of them know it and don't care. But most people probably would not be willing to admit, to admit they were serving Satan. I mean, I suppose if in one of my drunken stupors you were to say to me, you realize you're serving Satan, right? I probably would have went, what? No, I'm not, I'm just having fun. I'm just indulging myself, my appetite, my appetite for sin. Let's stand. We have overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of his testimony. However God saved you, wherever you were when he did save you, whatever lifestyle you were in when he saved you, <clears throat> you have served your sin enough. Put a period on the end of it. It's over with. It's done. You've been severed from that life by the life that you now have in Christ. God has forever snipped that life. Now, yes, we do still sin, right? But the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from unright all unrighteousness. <clears throat> so we do still sin, but that pattern's been broken. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. God has made us into something new. He's changed our minds. I mean, if you think about it, we, we don't really enjoy our sins, do we? I suppose there's some sins we're not aware of that we still do. But those sins that we are aware of now, they're not enjoyable anymore. And the reason they're not enjoyable is because God's not going to let us enjoy them because he loves us too much. He knows it'll destroy us. Sin will destroy you if you want to engage in it. If you want to indulge in it, it'll wipe you out. Satan is a hard taskmaster. He does not treat his disciples very well. Do you know that today? Do you understand that? Do you understand <clears throat> that serving the enemy will destroy your life? It'll ruin you? It'll bring you to nothing. And... If you were to die in that condition, as a non-believer, you will spend an eternity and not partying up with Jimi Hendrix, as that song says. They'll all be down there, you know? All those guys that died from their drug overdoses and from their sinful indulgence, they'll all be down there just partying away with Satan. No, they won't. Satan won't be partying. Satan isn't the Lord of hell. Satan is himself tormented in the lake of fire <clears throat> where the beast and false prophet will be and, will tho and where those who have denied Christ will be. So now there's no party going on. <clears throat> Life is as good as it gets right here, right now if you die in your sins. This is all you have.
There's nothing else to look forward to. So hopefully you all understand that, right? Father in heaven, I just want to pray, Lord, that you would please, please, God, help us to turn an absolute blind eye and a deaf ear to the vices that the world wants us to indulge in, Lord. And if the unsaved world mocks, <clears throat> gloats, Lord, we would rather suffer for your sake. We would rather take that stripe, receive that ridicule, maybe get pummeled with fists. But Lord, to serve you is what we want to do, Lord. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. God, give us that desire to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and thank you, God, for feeding our souls today. And Lord, until we come together again, I pray, God, that you'd bless our time of fellowship right now, Lord, and help us to be encouraged, Lord. When we belong to you, Lord God, we thank you, God, that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, guys.